Thankfulness can be hard to come by. Circumstances, brokenness, frustration, all get in the way. It can be difficult to see God through the fog. You want to stand firm, knowing God is in control. But you look around and you see chaos. How do you give thanks in such a moment? The truth is, life isn't easy. There's challenges. There's pain. There's heartache. Even though our landscape may change, we serve a God who never changes. But we're in our darkest moment. God promised to never leave us or forsake us. When our faith is shaken to its core, our God remains faithful. The world will ebb and flow. This is certain. But when we run with endurance the race set before us, and we fix our eyes on Jesus, we find thanksgiving. Hey, Ringgold, we're so glad to have you with us today here on Church Online. And we want to say on behalf of our church family to your family, Happy Thanksgiving. We hope that you had a blessed time with family and friends this past week and you were filled with gratitude for what God is doing and what God is about to do in your life. What we're going to do today is I think quite a few of us have a disease that has not yet been diagnosed. Now, maybe you have this sense that there's something missing within you. Maybe you have this sense that there's something just not right within you. Now, I know these symptoms are kind of generic, but let me give you some more specific symptoms so that if you can see today if you have this disease. A man with this disease has been known to walk into his garage, see a car that's less than two years old, and the car runs perfectly. And he thinks to himself, I need to trade this in for another car. Or a woman with this disease has been known to walk into a closet. Now into, not look into, but walk into. So she is surrounded by her clothes. And she says to herself, I have got nothing to wear. A person with this disease might look in the mirror and never like what they see in the reflection. They're always wondering how did they end up with their mom's thighs or dad's nose? A person with this disease tends to compare their spouse to other people. They're always wondering if they couldn't have gotten a, a better deal. They think that probably they could have done a, a little bit better. I think this disease is to blame for a lot of the divorce that happens in America today. I know this disease is to blame for much of the consumer debt that we are experiencing in America. People with this disease often have three, four, or five credit cards that are maxed out. I think you can blame almost all debt on this disease. This disease will make someone think that they always need to be making about twice as much money as they're currently making. If you have this disease, it's really important that you uh, not go to your friend's house, especially if they got brand new granite countertops and you don't. If they got iron spindles on their staircase and you don't, if they have a finished basement and you don't, if they got a brand new 86 inch television and you don't, it's better for you not to go. Now, I don't know if any of these symptoms describe you, but there is this disease within us. It's the disease of discontentment. And we could also call this disease the disease of me. I mean, it's an epidemic. Discontentment is an epidemic in our culture today. In our Western civilization, with all the advantages that we enjoy, people you know, all around the world would love to have most of our problems here in America. Uh, I mean, we, we have more things, more blessings here in America than any time in history or anywhere else. We try to treat this disease by self-medicating. You realize on average yearly, as a country, we spend nearly $1 billion in, in prescription drugs that will give us a sense of inner peace, a sense of contentment with life. People will turn to alcohol and drugs and pornography and food, 
all these other different ways to try to treat this discontentment they feel within. Now, I understand because discontentment will rob you of joy. You know, discontentment will keep you from living with joy every day. So the question for us to tackle today, this Thanksgiving weekend, is there a cure? Is there a secret to finding contentment within our lives? And this is what Paul addresses. This is what he talks about in Philippians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, you can follow right along with the app today at Ringgold Church or with your Bible or the app on your phone, uh, the Bible app. You can follow right along. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So notice what Paul says here that's so important from the New International Version. Contentment is a learned thing. Now, what, what he's saying is, is discontentment doesn't come, you know, this contentment doesn't come naturally. I mean, discontentment kind of seems to come naturally. Contentment doesn't. You know, we're not by nature a content people. I think that we kind of contract this disease of discontentment pretty early on in life. You know, when my children were toddlers, when they were starting to talk, my wife and I, Dana and I, we, we taught them to say a few words. We taught them to say please. We taught them to say thank you. But to be honest, these words did not naturally catch on. We were always having to remind our children, say please, say thank you, say thank you, say please. So it just never naturally came to them. Robert uh, Hastings, he pictures us on a, a train ride and he tries to describe this discontentment. He says, imagine yourself going on this long journey on a train. Outside the window as you're traveling are the, the beautiful cornfields and the rolling hillsides and the city skylines. But he says, you don't notice these things on the train because you're absolutely focused on getting to the station. In your mind, you have decided that the station is the place where you're going to find fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness. So you walk up and down the aisles of the train looking at your watch, wishing the train could go faster and faster and faster. If you could just get to the train station, everything would be good. Everything would be great. And here's what Hastings says. The name of the train is more. The name of the station is contentment. We think that when we get there, we're going to be content. When I get to the station, when, when I, you remember when I turned 16 and I get my driver's license, when I finally get my degree, when I have enough money to buy that Jaguar, when I lose weight, when I find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, you know, when I retire, you know, and I retire comfortably, you know, when I get to that station, that's when I'll be content. That's when we'll have happiness. The train called Moore is always headed to the station called contentment. Now, is that the secret that Paul is talking about here in Philippians chapter 4? He says, you know, the way to find contentment, you know, is, is not easy because the way to find contentment in our mindset is to get more and more and more. This is the message that is communicated to us as Americans on a daily basis. Our culture is constantly saying you need more and more and more to be content. We are bombarded with messages that remind us, you know, of all the things that we don't have. Do you know when I struggle with contentment? I struggle with contentment when I'm having to travel like overseas. I've been to India twice. And when you're on a long international flight and you get on these really nice large airplanes whenever I get on that airplane I struggle with contentment because you have to walk through the first class section first I've never really ever flown first class internationally they got these massive amount of legroom seats that are there armrests the size of a small bed and you go back to your seat and you're all cramped in I mean you're like firewood all stacked in there and I don't know about you, but when I get there, I want to have a seat that's either next to the window or next to the aisle. I don't want to be in that center seat all the way across the ocean. 
you know, I want to have an armrest and I want to, I want to, you know, I want to be able to capture that armrest and say it's my armrest because it's important when you get on an airplane to stake out your territory from the very beginning. I mean, this arm is not moving. This is my spot. And then when I'm sitting there and I get bored, I reach for the Sky Mall magazine. And, you know, I just want to do some recreational reading as I'm traveling. And that Sky Mall magazine is designed to make you discontent. Do you know what's in that magazine? You know, you, you don't just read through this Sky Mall magazine. It's full of inventions that you never knew existed. And now as you're looking through all these amazing things in the Sky Mall magazine, you're saying to yourself, I cannot live without these new inventions. And you start going through it going, man, I need this. I love to have that. Man, that is awesome. I could use this robot in my house. We look at this magazine and there's all these feelings of discontentment. I need to upgrade. Every year there are 50 billion mail order catalogs that are being published in America. And that doesn't include the internet now. And all the apps that you can download to shop at any second with Amazon and Walmart and Sam's Club and the list goes on and on. All of these things are designed and even the shopping networks on television to make us think that we need this. We need just what will make us happy, just a little bit, just a little bit more. Is that the secret to contentment? To be honest, if we were really pushed on what it would take to make us content, we would describe that our life needs more of something. We would describe a change in a circumstance or a change in our situation or a change in our bank account. Do you, did you hear what Paul said here in Philippians chapter 4? Now notice what he says again in Philippians 4 verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now what, what, it, what he's saying here is, is contentment is an intrinsic thing. Contentment comes from within. Contentment is not based on the external things around us. Contentment doesn't come and go based on the size of your bank account or the mechanical reliability of your car or the strength of the stock market or the housing market. You know, your contentment within is not based on the prognosis that the doctor gives you or the shape of your body. These things, contentment on the outside, don't bring contentment on the inside. If it comes from within, it's something that we learn. We learn to be content with what we have. Then what lessons do we need to learn in order to have contentment that can be found, as Paul says, in any and every situation in our lives if it comes from within? So here's the first lesson. Lesson number one, rejoice in the Lord. The first focus that we have to have is to the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I can be content. Paul says, I can be content in any and every situation if I will be disciplined. It takes discipline to be content. If I will be disciplined enough to look at the window of, the, of that train as it travels, to see all of God's creation, to see God's handiwork, to see God's blessing on my life. If I'll take note of God's grace, you know, God's grace, His unconditional love that He has poured into my life. If I will take notice of God's forgiveness and the promise of eternal life, I always have a reason to rejoice, as Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he says, rejoice because He's given me what I could never deserve. God has poured that grace and that mercy, that love into my life. And because of that, I now have joy. There's joy that resides within me. There's an inner peace that is there that cannot be masked by the world's things. Because God has met my needs. He's shown me what contentment truly is all about. When is the last time that you did this? When is the last time that you stepped back and you said, thank you, God? I rejoice in who you are. Thank you for how you have blessed me. When is the last time that you listed out all the things, the blessings from God? 
what situation is going on, you know, in your life right now, and you can still see that God's hand is upon your life, and God is working, and God is moving, and you can still rejoice in the Lord, whether you're in the midst of a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm. Jesus says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. A missionary returned from the island of Tobago, where she had worked with a leper colony. On the evening before she came back to the United States, she led that leper colony in a time of worship. And she asked them, is there anyone here who has a favorite song that they would like to sing? Now get this. She said a fingerless hand was raised in the back row. And a woman with no ears and no nose, a woman whose lips were gone, said, could we sing, count your many blessings? Wow. Whatever the situation is that you and I are going through, whatever the circumstance might be, there is always a reason. There is still a reason to rejoice in the Lord today. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Well, yeah, I mean, we look at this, you and I, 2,000 years later, we know the whole story of the Apostle Paul, and we're like, yeah, Paul... I mean, you're like a superhero. Yeah, I bet you are content. You're the Apostle Paul. He doesn't think of himself as someone in need, but he's in need. He's under house arrest whenever Paul writes to the church at Philippi. And so as he's writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ, he's under house arrest. He doesn't get any, you know, if, if he doesn't get money, you know, from, from the church and their support of him as, as, as a minister of the gospel, he can't pay for his house. He can't pay for his food. He's going to be thrown into prison. He's going to be thrown into the dungeon. He can't be in house arrest if he can't take care of the house that he's arrested in. So he has to have money for food. He is in need. He's been unjustly held as a prisoner in this house without any kind of charge for years. You know, he, he needs freedom. You and I look at this go, what Paul needs is freedom. He needs justice. He needs some sort of satisfaction there. How can Paul write in this moment, I'm content. And any time Paul knows he could be executed, he needs peace. He needs some kind of comfort. But he doesn't think about himself as someone who is in need. How can Paul say this, that he's chosen to be content? even though everything seems to be lined up against him. I think it's because Paul has learned not to compare himself, his life, and what is happening in his life to other people. Paul's not sitting there going, it's not fair. They're free. They're able to come and go as they please. And here I am under house arrest, and I've done nothing wrong. You see, what Paul is teaching us is nothing robs us of contentment quicker than comparisons. So here's lesson number two. Resist comparing yourself to other people. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. We do not dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. You know, a couple of years ago, friends here at church at Ringgold, they took me to a, a Cowboys game at uh, Washington, D.C., to to watch what is now called the Washington football team. Isn't that really weird and hard to say? I mean, who's your favorite team? For me, it's easy. The Cowboys. You know, but if, if you're a Washington fan, who's your favorite team? Washington. Doesn't that just sound weird? I mean, come on now. We just got to have some fun with this. So we went, and we had great seats. I sat there feeling very content, feeling very blessed. They brought all this food and all these snacks and drinks and all these different things that we could enjoy in this seat. We were having a good time. We were in the skybox. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a skybox, but it's like first class. It's like living the life. Lots of leg room. They, they have a great time. They have their own private bathrooms. I love, love watching a football game in the skybox. But... I never noticed that 
before how special those seats were because any time that I went to a football game and I had to sit in a regular seat, it was usually the wrong angle. It's the wrong setting. I'm right behind the, the, the goal post. I have to look through this thing. Or somebody comes and they sit in front of me and they got a great big head and I'm, you know, they're too tall. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, to, to watch. And I never noticed before how much leg room I didn't have because my knees were always up against the seat. And it was just a, a terrible, terrible experience. I, I don't know about you, but for a long time, I, I hated going to the stadium and sitting in regular kind of seats because it was so claustrophobic. <laughs> And it's just kind of miserable. Why would you want to do that when you could sit in the skybox, first class? Didn't know anything about it until I had sat into the skybox seats. Comparisons rob us of contentment. There was a study done in Muncie, Indiana, and they found that there was a large percentage of women in Muncie who were working, but they didn't need to work. They didn't want to work. But there was a sociological study done to see why these women were working. Didn't need to work, didn't want to work, so why are they working? And what they found out was the number one, one, the number one reason that they were working is so that they were able to afford things that other people already had. In other words, they wanted more. You see, we're always comparing ourselves to what others have. Have you noticed this about your comparisons? We always compare up. We don't compare down. Don't do that. I do that all the time. I always compare up. I'm always looking at what I don't have. If we compare down, if we compare down to people who have less than we do or less fortunate we are, it brings feelings of gratitude. But we don't typically do that. We'd be more thankful for what we have and the blessings that we've received, but we don't typically compare down. We always compare up. No matter what level we reach, we're always comparing ourselves to the person on the, on the level ahead of us. And the problem with that is, is when we're comparing to what they have, it's all about more and more and more. And there's always someone ahead of you who has more than you do. So we keep comparing up. And it creates these feelings of discontentment deep down inside of us. I mean, we're happy. And then we see someone who is happier. And we're like, I want to be happier. How do I become happier? I got to have more. Or we see someone who is more attractive than us. And it creates all these feelings of discontentment within us. Or we see someone who has more money. There's always going to be someone who has more money. There's always going to be someone who's more attractive. It's just always going to happen if you're comparing yourselves and you're comparing up. There was a study that was done in Newsweek, Newsweek magazine, and people were asked, what would it take to make you happy? What would it take to make you satisfied with life? And they found that people who made the average, made the average salary of $25,000 a year said they would be content if they made $54,000 a year. If I could just make $54,000 a year, they said, I would be satisfied with that. The same study was done with people who made $100,000 a year, and they said, what would it take for you to be content you know, in life? And they responded by saying, if I had made $192,000 on average a year, I would be content. Of course you would. <laughs> the, lesson, the lesson in all that was that contentment is basically found in twice as much as what you're currently making. That's a scary thought. How do you keep up in that kind of cycle? Paul resists comparing himself to other people. He comes again and says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So Paul Paul is speaking to us as someone who has been on both sides of the tracks. He knows what it's like to have a lot. He, know, he knew what it was like to be you know, well off, not to have any need. He grew up in a setting where it was pretty well to do, you know, pretty well to do family. He went to the right school. He was now under house arrest. He knows what it's like just to have just enough to get by just a little. These are rough times for the Apostle Paul. 
And he, he just wants to be very clear of this fact. You may have a lot or you may have little, but that's not what contentment is all about. Because if you have a little now and you're not content, then you're not going to be content if you have a whole lot later on. Whatever you are doing right now, whatever you have right now, you know, and how you feel, contentment level, that's how you're going to feel even if you add more to it later on. Now, if you think that you're getting a lot and a lot is what's going to make you content, Paul says it won't. In fact, if you're not content now with what you have, you'll even be more discontent later on when you get a lot more because you'll be thinking you need more on top of that. The more you have, the more you're going to end up wanting more and more. It's a vicious cycle. That's what Paul's saying. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. Just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. Wow, <laughs> that's a scary thought, isn't it? There's always room for more. If you're looking for material blessings to satisfy that need within you, you are never, ever going to be content in this world. It doesn't matter if you have a lot or if you have a little. Now, here's the third lesson. Lesson number three, recognize what doesn't bring contentment. So if we know that material blessings, like, like this year, if you got the iPhone 11 and you're always looking to improve, you're probably struggling right now and maybe freaking out because they came out with the iPhone 12. You can never keep up. If external things could bring us contentment, if external things could give us life, we would be the most contented people on planet Earth in America. According to a recent uh, census that was taken, 76% of poor households in America, and I get this, 76% of poor households in America have air conditioning today. 30 years earlier, only 36% of the entire U.S. population had, it, had air conditioning. In 1973, the average size of a house being built was just a little over 1,600 square feet. Today, the average size of a house being built in America is just under 2,600 square feet. According to the census, 97% of poor households today have a colored television. 78% of poor households have a, a DVD player. 62% of poor households have cable or satellite TV. If we could find contentment in material things, we would be the most contented people on planet Earth. When visiting third world countries, I've always expected to see people who are miserable in their conditions. If you've ever been to a third world country, you're going to see things that will totally blow your mind in comparison to what we've experienced in America. After all, how could you be happy without air conditioning? How could you be happy without McDonald's and drive through without pizza? And preferably, all of those things at the same time, right? How can you be happy and content without a hot shower? But what I found was that whether you're in the dumps, you know, in the bad places, like Haiti, or in a remote land far away from major cities in India, a lot of people didn't struggle with discontentment at all. In fact, studies have shown that depression and, dis and discontentment are almost non-existent in the non-westernized -Western world. So why is that? Why is it that depression and discontentment are almost non-existent in non-westernized cultures? You got to ask yourself, are material blessings really blessings? Now think about that. Are material blessings in our lives really blessings? They're not blessings if we look to them, these external things, to find contentment in this world. Eventually, we all recognize that these things don't bring contentment. Unfortunately, we have to learn this the hard way. We learn it by the process of elimination. We, we strive to get more and more and more, and finally we wake up one day going, wait a minute, more did not make me happier. More did not bring me joy. We learn it through the process of elimination. 
We don't take someone else's word. I mean, we could listen to our parents. We could listen to our grandparents. We could listen to our great-grandparents, and they could talk about this is where contentment is found. You're not going to find contentment in the world. You're not going to find it in these things. But no, no, we have to experience it for ourselves. We kind of take Solomon's approach to satisfaction. I mean, it's like there's a, a buffet of all these different things in our world, in our culture that promise us satisfaction. So, man, we grab a plate of this and we look it over and we think, man, you know what? If I get a little bit of this and I get a little bit of that and I'm walking down the buffet line of life and, you know, I'm going to find contentment. So I want a little bit of success. I want a little bit of achievement. I want to move up the ladder. So we load up. So, man, we're loading our plate up. So we'll work, you know, 60 hour work weeks for years and years and years. And we finally get that promotion. We finally get that title. And for a while, maybe even for a few years, we're like, wow, I've arrived. I'm satisfied. I'm finally someone. We're content. But then the hunger begins to return within us and it begins to turn away. We grab another plate and we head down the buffet line looking for contentment. We go back thinking, I got to get some of this. So let me add more money to it. Give me some more material possessions. And we just start piling up our plate as we walk down this buffet line of life in America. And we build up our portfolio. We get a second home on the beach. We, we build a cabin in the mountains. You know, we buy a boat so we can go to the lake and we buy a trailer so we can go out camping and we buy a BMW and we put it in the garage and, you know, we drive our beat up car. But then when we want to put the top down, we want to head out for a drive on Sunday afternoon. We got the BMW. And for a moment, all those pains are gone. I've arrived. I'm content. And then all of a sudden we get hungry again and we grab another plate and we head down the buffet line. Maybe Maybe it's a romantic relationship outside of my marriage. Maybe it's a sexual pleasure. Maybe it's entertainment. Maybe these things. If I just travel more, I, you know, I go to this resort. I go to this place. I do that. That's what will satisfy me. And we do these things. And for a moment, we're going, man, this is life. But after a while, the hunger comes back again. I mean, it's like after your Thanksgiving dinner meal, you go and head for the lazy boy. And you kind of loosen your belt and you say to yourself, I will never eat again. And then you doze off and you take a nap. And 45 minutes later, you wake up and you're, you're thinking, man, you know what sounds good? A turkey sandwich sounds pretty good right now. And a little pumpkin pie on the side with Cool Whip on top of it. And we think, wow, this is what's going to satisfy me. And, and we, we, we fill up again. We're thinking, wow, I'm good to go. I, I'm not, I'm not going to eat the rest of the day. And another hour goes by and you're thinking, you know what? I, I need some of that persimmon pudding. So I go get some of that persimmon pudding and I put the Cool Whip on top and I dive into that and I'm like, I'm not going to eat anything else. And we just keep doing this. And the hunger keeps coming back over and over again. What is the secret? What is the secret to contentment? Where is contentment found? Paul gives it to us. Number four, lesson number four. Jesus is all you really need. It's kind of interesting that pretty much every message that we see that Paul kind of gives to us, it kind of comes to the same conclusion. How do you have hope? Jesus. How do you have joy? Jesus. Where do you find humility? Jesus. It always comes back to Jesus. There's a sense in which I, I feel like that makes things so simple. And maybe just here in a moment, just in that one moment when I said those few things, some of you today rode, kind of rolled your eyes in typical preacher speak, Jesus is the answer for everything. Maybe for us, it seems a little bit trite. It's kind of like, well, I'm sitting in Sunday school again, and Don just pulled out the Jesus flannel graph and put it up. You know, the answer to every question is Jesus. But it's true. The answer is Jesus. It doesn't mean that you won't have struggles and troubles in this world. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials in this life. It doesn't mean the storms and sometimes the bad storms are not going to come, but it means that Jesus is more than enough, and Jesus is who will see you through the storms of life. Jesus 
is enough. And Paul puts it this way. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul says, you know how I've learned to be content? Contentment is not found in anything that is out there. It's found from an inner strength that comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the only one who truly satisfies. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He talks to this church. Now, when Paul writes this letter that you and I read in the Bible today called Philippians, it's written to a church in Philippi. And he's basically encouraged them to be content. Now, the word he uses here for contentment is a surprising word. It would have stood out to his readers when he was writing to them. It was a word that was taken from a pagan belief system known as uh, sto Stoism of his day. People who followed this pagan belief of Stoism uh, were called Stoics. And at the foundation of Stoism was the word that Paul uses here for contentment. He steals this word from this pagan belief. He says, no, I'm really the one who's found it. I just want to touch on the Stoics, this pagan belief system, on their pathway to contentment. He says, you need to eliminate all emotion. Now, they said in this pagan belief, this is how you find uh, contentment. You just need to eliminate all emotion. So the Stoics believed that's what it was. You just, if you didn't feel anything, you'd be content. You eliminate all emotion, then you come to the point in your life where you really just don't care because you don't have any feelings. Have you ever kind of thought like that? Felt like that? If I just didn't have any feelings, if I just turn everything off, then I'll be content. That's what the Stoics taught. That's not what Paul says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Paul says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So what Paul says, because the, the church at Philippi would have understood this teaching of the Stoics, contentment is not found in having this whatever kind of apathetic attitude. It's not about eliminating emotion in your life. It's found, contentment is found in trusting Jesus Christ, no matter what the circumstances are. The Stoics, this false teaching, their pathway to contentment was, well, you just got to accept everything that happens as fate. Now, it's just basically it's life. It's just going to happen. Just accept it. It doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't matter what happens in your life because it's out of your control. So you just might as well be content. Again, that's not what Paul was teaching here as he writes to the church of Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what Paul says is contentment isn't found in saying, well, there's nothing else I can do here. Contentment is found in turning all those things over to the Lord. Now, another part of this false belief system that the, the Stoics were teaching was this. You need to eliminate all desire. This is what the Stoics would have been teaching in the city of Philippi. You just uh, eliminate all desire. If you really want to be happy, then you have no desire for possessions. You have no human desires for anything else. You have no desires for whatever. Paul didn't say to live this life without desires. He just said the only thing that will satisfy your desires within is Jesus Christ. All these things that we see on the buffet line of life, all these things that we try to get a scoop of that will give us satisfaction in this world, they only accomplish one thing. They point us to the living water. They point us to the bread of life. They point us to Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus Christ will you not thirst again. Only in Jesus Christ will you not hunger again. Jesus is the only one who can truly satisfy that contentment deep within us. Only Jesus can give us that joy factor. He is our cure. Jesus is our cure for our disease of discontentment. You know, in some ways, living in 2020 is the hardest place 
in the hardest time in the history of the world to find contentment in Jesus. Because even though we went through a lot of difficulties in a year of pandemic and chaos and politics, we still found that there's all kinds of other options out there that we look for satisfaction from. And all these things, when we're struggling with life and what life is throwing at us, all these things that we reach out and we grab a hold of, they can mask the hunger that we feel. And they only mask it temporarily. And we never really realize that Jesus is more than enough. That Jesus is enough because we keep trying. We know what Paul says. Jesus is the one who can meet those needs. But isn't it amazing how we always come back and say, but, and we reach for something else on the buffet line, something else that will satisfy that hunger within, and we go from thing after thing after thing, scoop after scoop after scoop down the buffet line of life, and we put it off, reaching out for Jesus. All these things last temporarily just for a little bit of time only jesus will satisfy forever mother Teresa, she said you'll never know that jesus is all you need until jesus is all you got i've been thinking about this issue of contentment a lot i'll be honest with you i struggle with it just like you do it doesn't really matter if you're rich or poor. It really comes down to this. If Jesus is all you had, would Jesus be enough? So how would you, this Thanksgiving weekend, answer that question? If Jesus is all you had, would he be enough? If Jesus is all you had, would he be enough? Let's think about that today. Father God, I thank you that today, Lord, you have taught us that you are more than enough. Lord, that you have taught us that everything that the world wants to give to us that will satisfy will not. And Father, we want to be able to sing the words of the old hymn. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus in houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be a king of a vast domain or held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Father, I pray today that those words would be the words upon our hearts. And Father, we're thankful. We're so thankful this Thanksgiving weekend, but not just this time of year, every day for your faithfulness to us. Father, you are a good, good Father. Your love endures forever. Thank you, God, today for your grace, your unconditional love for us. Father, we thank you for your salvation, the salvation that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And we are so grateful for our eternal hope in Christ, in Christ alone. So, Father, we're thankful for Jesus' promise that you never leave us, nor do you forsake us. You never give up on us. Thank you for your presence in our lives today, the power that we receive through the gift of your Holy Spirit in us. And, Father, we know and acknowledge here today that in the waiting, in the searching, even in the healing and the hurting, these moments are like a blessing buried in broken pieces. And Father, we come to you as broken people, knowing that we can only be mended by Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for that hope and for that promise, even when we could not see it ourselves. Jesus is always more than enough. Thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you again. Happy Thanksgiving.
As a church, it's an honor and a pleasure to be a part of what God is doing in your life. So thanks for joining us today. But what now? To find out what your next steps are to grow in your relationship with Christ, be sure to visit ringgoldchurch.com. At Ringgold, we believe growing people change. So we want to invite you to join us for Mended Life Talk on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. We will be diving deeper into this week's message with questions, scripture, and challenges to go deeper in our faith walk. If you haven't already done so, now is a great time to set up online giving. We want to thank you for financially giving to Ringgold Church so we can continue to serve and make an impact in our different communities and our world. Giving is an important step in our spiritual growth and maturity. You can give online through the Ringgold Church app or at ringgoldchurch.com. If you are not comfortable with giving online, you can also visit ringgoldchurch.com to view other possible ways to give as well. Well, thanks for hanging out with us today. We can't wait to see you next time at Ringgold Church Online.